Hello and welcome to On Ancient Earth Artist Talks. On Ancient Earth is an exhibition about the relationship we have with what lies beyond the outer edges of Earth's atmosphere. This is the first in a series of artist talks accompanying the exhibition. You can see many of the works from speakers in the exhibition at theartistexpeditionsociety.com slash on ancient earth until Sunday the 4th of October. This talk series is broadcasted from and tuned into from many places around the world, but its central base is in Alice Springs and Bantwa, Australia, which is on Aranda country. And I would like to acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. There's a very insightful welcome to country by local Aranda woman Kumali Riley associated with this exhibition, which is available to view on the website until the exhibition closes this Sunday, the 4th of October. A little bit of housekeeping um, during the session. Um, just if you have any comments, feel free to type them in the chat box. We will be taking a break um, for, for bathrooms between speakers, and we will also be recording these sessions. Um, if you'd like to um, type your name, location, and pronouns into the chat box, um, that would be really wonderful. Um, and if you do have any comments about what the artists are talking about, feel free to write them in the chat box and at the end of the session I'll read them out. Um, so this exhibition and talk series is a part of the Desert Festival, an annual arts festival in Alice Springs. The talk series was funded by the Alice Springs Town Council and On Ancient Earth was co-curated by Lumen's Rebecca Huxley, Louise Beer and Melanie King, as well as myself, Anna Dakin, from the Artist Expedition Society. Today's speakers are Rebecca, Louise and Melanie from Lumen, a London-based art, arts collective, and they'll be speaking first. Lumen focuses on analog film, celestial bodies, and the relationships between churches and the night sky. Our second speaker will be Kitoko Diva from the United Kingdom. Diva's speculative piece, The Black Man in the Cosmos, is also featured in On Ancient Earth. Her work talks about the vastness of space and the psychological, the psychological escape that that vastness offers, commenting on identity, race, social structures, and surrealism. Our third speaker is Sarah Edmondson from Ireland, and Sarah has a pre-recorded talk for us. Sarah's piece, A Raised Moon, is also featured in On Ancient Earth. And A Raised Moon asks, what, asks whether when we name something, do we claim possession or ownership of that thing? Is naming a tool of colonization? A very powerful question. Our final speaker for today is Selena Leger, an Italian artist based in Brazil. Selena makes work about poetry, philosophy, and mythology, mainly using painting and digital images. Um, but before Selena, Lumen, I'll hand over to you. Um, you are our first speakers for today. Everybody, it's really nice to um, see you all. Um, and I'm not sure if Anna just said, but please do put in your the location that you're watching the talks from in the chat box as well. So, um, Lumen is myself, Louise Beer, Rebecca Huxley, and Melanie King. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we began as a collective. Um, we formed, we had our first exhibition in 2014 called Lumen One in the St Pancras Crypt Gallery um, in London, which was our first kind of beginnings of trying to put artwork about astronomy into churches and seeing how these two things reacted together and it was a really wonderful exhibition and we've had lots and lots of exhibitions there ever since um, and so from this idea we went on to have an exhibition the second one in 2015 called Dark from Night which was about light pollution and that was at the St. John and Bethnal Green Church upstairs, where um, we then moved into the gallery in the crypt downstairs. So in 2015, we had an exhibition at St. John and Bethnal Green, which was all about light pollution, as Louise said. And we went downstairs during that um, exhibition and saw this amazing space, which was um, completely empty. And as soon as we walked into the door, we could see its potential to be a gallery because it was just such a beautiful, unique space. 
Um, so every year we have been having quite a few different exhibitions. This is a picture from our launch, which was in 2015, where we made this uh, clip sculpture. And um, so people were able to walk into the space and were able to um, walk around the structure. Um, we've had lots of exhibitions from different groups. Um, and this was a show by Hannah Scott and Maria Mack, which was all about the ocean. Um, and we've had lots of different types of shows all related to astronomy, light and science since the beginning of opening the gallery. And we've also had things like residencies um, within the crypt, which will be talked about later. So we've, we've had a number of commissions in the last four years. Um, this one is, uh, was commissioned by Green Man Festival in 2017. Um, to recreate an installation as part of to, to create an installation as part of the visual arts program, um, and this installation reimagined the total solar eclipse that was occurring at the same time as Green Man, but only visible in the United States. So it was made to create like a collective viewing experience under the pine trees. Um, it became particularly like it was a particularly good site for reflection um, and relaxation. Um, and to talk about myths and stories surrounding the total eclipse as well. Uh, this is uh, another eclipse installation created and commissioned by Vivid Projects for Black Hole Club um, as part of an exhibition we created, curated called Stella. Um, okay. uh, this is one of our most recent uh, commissions which was commissioned by the Museum of Freemasonry um, where we were um, invited to respond to their collection and symbolism which features, features lots of imagery of day and night so we cr created a light-based installation um, with a selection of astronomy inspired items not usually on public display. Um, this next image uh, was in one of the four display cases and this was in a display case called Heavens. Um, this is quite an intriguing item and it's called an Honour and Generosity Tracing Board um, from 1819 um, and the sun, moon and stars were particularly illuminated in the space. Tracing boards were a way for Freemasons to pass on teachings as they progress through their degrees. Okay, great. Uh, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about residences. So through the um, years, we've had several people do residences in the crypt. This is an exhibition by an amazing artist called Julie Hill about the James Webb Telescope. So we've had people um, in the crypt for periods of sort of two two to three weeks who work in the space and then uh, respond to the space and create work for an exhibition. One of the main things that we've done is um, a residency in Italy in a town called Atina where lots and lots of our wonderful network have been and shared the time with us there. Um, in Italy we go for two to two and a half weeks and there are about 20 to 25 artists who join us um, and we stay in an old nunnery and this is an example of one of the bedrooms that looks out onto the beautiful mountains around Atena. In this, during this time we visit lots of wonderful, wonderful places. This is Monte Cassino which is a um, beautiful Catholic monument on the mountain. Whilst we're there, we also uh, visit several observatories and um, also different churches as well. So it's a really wonderful way of getting people from all over the world together to talk about different cultural understandings of the night skies. And then at the end of the residency, a couple of months after we come back, we um, have a big exhibition at the St Pancras Crypt Gallery, which is where, we, where it all began. Um, and we also publish a zine as well. 
And as part of the residency, we award one artist a solo show in the crypt. And this is Amel Tulunda's work. We have run residencies in the UK as well. This is in Grisdale in the Lake District, where we took a group of artists up for a couple of days to experience the darker skies in the UK. And we had a wonderful exhibition here at the Grisdale Project Space. We have also been to um, Cornwall, to Lizard Point, um, where we ran a residency with Joanna Mays last year, um, which was a really wonderful experience to see the British coastline as well, which was exceptionally beautiful. Um, and there we did lots of analog photography experimentations as well. And after that we had an exhibition in Helston and also in the Lumen Crypt Gallery. We've also curated a large number of exhibitions in lots of different venues. So one of our main partners is Ugly Duck in Bermondsey and they have this amazing um, warehouse style space which is about four stories high. Um, and we have curated shows such as the School of Light, which was all about artists working with light in creative ways. And then more recently, we had an exhibition curated with Becky Leon, which was um, particularly about technology and that was called Through the Looking Glass. Um, and we work with lots of different things like projection and sound and um, two dimensional works and sculpture. So this is a piece of work by Anna Gray, which is made completely out of glass. And this is an example of one of the rooms of where the exhibition takes place. Um, this is a piece by Yan Bei Tang, which was about a black hole. And this is part of the Pi Factory show in Margate where um, myself and Louise are both based. Uh, and this was looking at lots of different types of artwork. So there were light installations again, projections, sculpture, two-dimensional works, um, and other types of things. We also had a show at Chelsea College of Art, which was beside a symposium called On Light. Um, curated by Sarah Boso and we had a show in the Marg space as Chelsea College of Art used to be a hospital and um, so we really worked with the unconventional exhibition type space that they had available there. This is a show which was a collaboration with Vivid Projects in Birmingham um, and we worked with the Black Hole Club, who all made uh, audio, visual and technologically based works um, in relationship to space. So this was a audio visual piece which responded to movement within the room. So Print the Moon is an event we've been running for a few years. Um, coll we collaborate with Paul Hill, an astronomer, who's, um, if you want to find him online, he's, uh, his handle is Sirius Astro, Sirius Astronomy. Um, and those events start with him giving an informal talk about the scale of the solar system and the universe. Um, each person then gets to have a look through a number of telescopes that Paul brings. Um, and then we help those people to take photographs with their smartphone through the telescope. Um, it's a really unique thing because people then get to take home a Polaroid photograph of their own image of the moon. Oh, Anna, you're on mute um, myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not part of Lumen, but I will talk about um, the exhibition that we've co-curated. I've just posted a link into the chat. 
Um, so On Ancient Earth takes place physically in Central Australia um, at a really unique venue called the Earth Sanctuary. Um, and this image is a picture of one of the dome tents out at the Earth Sanctuary. They've got five of these geodesic dome tents um, and it does have very Mars-like feeling with the red earth. Um, the sanctuary itself um, do astronomy talks um, almost every night of the week, which is really interesting. Um, and it's a really great location as all of Central Australia is for vast and clear views of the night sky. Um, out here, um, uh, when the moon is small, you can see the Milky Way extremely clearly. You can see the dark patches in the Milky Way. You can see, um, you can see um, clouds of dust um, out in space. Um, and it's very rare for us to actually have clouds within Earth's atmosphere um, in this part of the world. Um, one of the, the reasons that um, On Ancient Earth came about um, the way that it, it, it did, which is um, an online exhibition of works that have been photographed at the Earth Sanctuary, is um, because of the, the virus and the lockdown, um, and the kind of tragedy that comes from people's um, view of the night sky being restricted um, by essentially being trapped in locations that have terrible light pollution. Um, I think it's easy to forget in Central Australia just how lucky we are to be able to see the night sky and the kind of physical philosophy that comes from being exposed to it regularly. Um, so On Ancient Earth was really a way for, um, for, for the Artist Expedition Society and Lumen to invite artists to almost throw their works and their ideas up out into the night sky um, in the hope that maybe that big important presence somehow would um, would understand just how important and precious it is for us. Um, so the exhibition um, is, is very diverse. Um, there are 30, 15 artists um, from eight different countries um, and each of the pieces is very unique and very different and I highly recommend having a look um, and spending a bit of time with all of the different works as well. Hmm. Thank you so much for listening to Lumen's talk, everybody. Amazing. Thank you so much, guys. That was really, really interesting. Um, next up is Diva. Thank you for inviting me and also thank you for, um, uh, yes, organizing all of this. This is great. Uh, I thought the theme of the, the exhibition was great. So I'm very happy to be part of this. Yes. That's wonderful. Well, we're very happy that you are a part of it. Your work's really wonderful. Thank you so much. Um. <laughs> uh, but yes, yeah, so um, this piece that I created um, is a part of a video installation project. That means a lot to me on so many levels. Uh, this was a bit like a reset button uh, to allow me to start fresh again and scratch everything that I have uh, ever done before and give the tone and direction where I'm... Um, heading to with my uh, videography practice and filmmaking. Um, I started to work on this project last year in 2019, but it really was a long journey that started uh, years ago when I was this uh, young black French teenager moving to the States, uh, because at the time I felt that uh, this was the only place where I could uh, embrace and celebrate my blackness. So from this young teenager, we then uh, became this young lady uh, who came to London uh, because I still felt like an outcast in my own country. Um, I had a lot of questions about my identity, about my, my heritage, and I was, um, I think I was very confused on the, um, about my culture uh, and my knowledge about my, my story. Um, so, uh, the black man in the cosmos has been for me a way to, um, to connect the pieces of the puzzle that I had in my head and, uh, give a snapshot of, uh, what was really going on. Uh, and now it's 2020, um, and, uh, this piece is, uh, in a sense making even, yeah, it, it, it making even more sense uh because it really resonates with our times we are living a moment uh hopefully of changes for black people a moment full of pain uh 
anger and actions, where the conversation is mainly focused on the American experience. So uh, this piece is in a way bringing the conversation here in Europe, where there is a need to have a conversation too. So, so yes, um, the, the black French identity has shifted over the years to an identity that is uh, culturally stronger, an identity that I feel that we can easily more identify, uh, that we can, let's say, more localize and it's less globalized. I'm saying that because when I was a teenager, the American culture um, uh, was very strong in the identity construction of uh, the Black French youth. We were breathing through the music, the movies, the pop culture, uh, and the fashion of the United States. And in my opinion, it has caused a lot of damage of, um, of um, it has caused a lot of damage because we ended up with uh, a generation that didn't really own his, his, uh, his own unique black French identity. And uh, I feel like we, we, we were not able to talk about identity crisis because we didn't have an identity in the first place, I mean, in my opinion. So, so yeah, I didn't really grow up with, um, uh, you know, with books teaching me about black French history or black French heroes. Uh, those books have never existed for the simple reason that officially um, black French individuals uh, don't exist in the French society. Our constitutions, uh, or, or our French constitution says that we are one republic, that there are no colors, uh, no races, that we are all French with no distinctions. Uh, we don't even know officially how many black people are in France uh, because it is illegal for the French state to collect um, data on uh, ethnicity and races. And um, when you think about it, it comes from a good intention because it came from a desire to put some unity to the nation, to create a co cohesion among us. But um, unfortunately, this works only on paper uh, because on the field, uh, in real life, it, it doesn't uh, properly work. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't be finding ourselves in such a situation uh, today. Um, there is um, there is a quote that uh, Sun Ra, uh, the jazz man, uh, says in the film "Space is the Place." Uh, it's a film that I use as a common thread through my world piece, uh, and it says, um, "I come to you as a myth." You don't exist in the society. If you did, uh, you people wouldn't be seeking equal rights. Uh, I don't come to you as a reality. I come to you as a myth, because this is what black people are, myth. And um, so yeah, this is what my video work is about. Um, um, and the other layer of lecture, you um, uh, say it really well, Anna, at the beginning when uh, you introduced my, um, uh, my piece, um, it's really about um, what, where do we go from this, uh, where we are heading to as a group, and uh, what is the future? Um, and in the, in the 70s, Sun Ra did an artist in residence in uh, UC Berkeley, and he offered a, a spring semester lecture on African American studies, uh, and the lecture was called The Black Man in the Cosmos. Uh, you can listen to some of those lectures online or uh, in some um, faculty websites. And on all those theories, uh, one of the theories that really struck me the most was, was the one related um, on the related about the related with the alter destiny. Uh, the alter destiny is the is this space is the space is the space right ab above our heads. Um, with uh, tremendous possibilities, um, a space where you could chase something bigger uh, than what we have here um, uh, on Earth, uh, something that is uh, divine, something that can give you hope. So the the the, the vast 
the vast uh, uh, dimension of the space give this hope uh, because uh, it is something that is so impossible that can be that cannot possibly be true and the impossible thing is the answer but the impossible has never been achieved by men so the response is the the space so my main wish with the film was really to translate uh, the 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 vast of the space and uh, translate this hope and uh, to translate that the altered destiny theory uh, I wanted to translate to translate it uh, not only with words, but I really wanted uh, anyone that will see the video to feel to feel this vast emotion uh, in their body and um, in their spirits. I wanted to create a feeling of um, a sensation of a cosmic experience of an extraterrestrial moment where people who allow themselves to dream uh, and to, um, yes, and to live a, like a space travel. Um, I, yeah, I wanted to make a film that looked like it came out uh, this alternate universe, uh, something oniric, a space travel that actually made you feel that, again, you reach the cosmos. Um, I was watching uh, this interview uh, with uh, Arthur Jaffa, who is a very um, fascinating filmmaker and video artist that I uh, really uh, encourage you to look up. Uh, so I was uh, looking at one of his interviews and he was saying that one of his challenges was to figure out how to make um, films and videos in a vernacular that might intimate the African American experience as well as um, uh, as well as popular music have been doing so far and I've been thinking about this a lot uh, and what it really entails and I realized that uh, in a way I found myself in the same position uh, with my video practice uh, how to translate our experiences how to translate it into uh, movie images and use the the space uh, as an installation uh, to create uh, immersive uh, experiences. So, so yeah. And um, uh, I often try to, uh, when people are uh, ask me about my practice, I, I often try to make a point about uh, the fact that I'm not particularly uh, overly concerned about creating stories that necessarily have to have the sense of uh, narration of logic. Uh, I'm not afraid, you know, to deconstruct narration and end up with um, non-linear content. Uh, and I think what counts the most for me is to create um, uh, um, is to create moments where people uh, will be allowed to 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 dream. To dream. I like to uh, create um, languages that will blur the line between documentary and, uh, and fiction. Um, and one work that really was um, a game changer for me was The Last Angel of History. Uh, it came out in 96 uh, by John Amcomfra and uh, Edward George. Uh, both, mem both are members of the Black Audio Film Collective, uh, which is uh, based here in the UK. Uh, it was a hybrid mix of documentary and fictional narrative uh, that was creating a network of um, link between music, space, uh, Afrofuturism and the diaspora. I was really amazed by the intro of the film um, that started with a black man in the middle of um, the bayou or maybe in the Mississippi, I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, this man uh, was telling the story of uh, Robert Johnson who sold his soul uh, to the devil in order to play the blues. Uh, and what he got in return was a black secret technology, the blues, uh, which we produce uh, the history of black music that we have today. And those first few uh, minutes of the film uh, really set the tone straight away, you know, for um, with this futuristic tenor, the relationship with the, Pan the Pan-Africanism with the space. And it was really, yeah, a masterful film of Black history and memory. Uh, 
Um, so, so yeah, it was a deployment of science fiction. Um, I was jumping, you know, time between the time and space from the past to the future to the present. Um, and uh, this was really a really, it was really an eye opener for me in terms of understanding what could be the limit of uh, cinema and um, documentary and how to contribute to a lineage of black arts. So yeah, there is one more thing that I can say before I um, finish. Um, I think it's some word also about this other layer of lecture about the film. Uh, I could describe it as um, uh, a reel to uh, use the space to reestate history, uh, fight erasure and force accountability. Um, I'm using archive as a memory to a memory bank to make people face the truth and it's um, and I think it's very interesting how uh, something uh, made from the past could be reused in another context and uh, still be creating something new. Uh, all, the, all the archive I, are, that I use are completing uh, the vision and adding to the narrative of artifacts and clues. Um, and uh, it creates a thread of thoughts and ideas that complete each one another until finally meaning one cohesive uh, message. Um, and the way I agents all of it, it's very inspired by uh, Chris Marker and his hypnotic college of words and uh, images. Um, not so much on his habit of creating very fragmented cuts, but more on his will to um, explore the video medium uh, limits and um, uses, uh, use them as a, uh, elusive polysemic friends. So yeah, I'm think when I think about it, I'm thinking about one of his work called uh, Statues Also Die that he did with uh, Alain René. Uh, it's a short that was talking about historical African art and the effect of uh, colonialism uh, has had on how it's perceived in Europe. So yes, one that you should really see if you didn't. So yeah, so many things to say, but if there is one thing that I wish people would keep uh, from the black men in the cosmos, it's really how it, he made them feel and how it made them feel on the um, possibilities of the space. So yes. Hi, um, my name is Sarah Edmondson and I am one of the artists exhibiting as part of On Ancient Earth, um, an exhibition at the Earth Sanctuary in Alice Springs. Uh, so I'm absolutely delighted that my video, A Raised Moon, was selected to be part of this exhibition um, alongside a fantastic uh, lineup of artists. Uh, so before I start my talk, I would like to just thank Anna Dagen. Um, Anna, I hope that's the correct pronunciation of your name. And the Lumen team, Louise Beer, uh, Melanie King and Rebecca Huxley. Um, so this talk was supposed to be delivered live online, um, however, due to my own work commitments and different time zones, I am providing a pre-recorded talk. Uh, nonetheless, I'm going to keep it pretty informal um, and chatty. So to introduce myself, I am a visual artist working in Dublin. I graduated from the National College of Art and Design in 2012 with a BA in art and design education. So as well as being a practitioner, I'm also an art educator. Um, I work mainly in moving image, um, installation and photography. So I've just recently completed a two year MFA at NCAD in sculpture and expanded practice. So a raised moon um, was a video that I produced as part of my MFA. Um, so you can see it here being projected on the exterior of one of the geodesic domes at the Earth Sanctuary. Um, so as part of this talk, I'm going to explain to you the ideas behind this video and then also talk to you about my work, The Clinching Gift. And yeah, just basically kind of um, talk you through my research that I conducted as part of my MFA. Um, and how I go about making work and the decisions I make in mediating that work to an audience. 
So this is a text um, written by me in 2020 and it um, is a text that I think or hopefully um, coherently um, explains some of my ideas and concerns. Uh, so I'm going to read this text to you and then hopefully elaborate on some of the ideas as I move through the slides. Uh, so the title of the text is The Subjection of the Moon to the Mind of Man, 12 White Men to be specific. So even in the title, I'm trying to highlight the fact that knowledge is subjective and that to date, um, it has only been 12 white American men that have stepped foot on the moon. Um, which I find problematic and it is hopefully going to be something that is will be resolved soon. Um, okay, so can the moon be understood beyond any human description or naming? As soon as we, us humans, name something, we claim possession or ownership of that thing. In an effort to understand, we label and categorize, colonizing the object or place. A phenomenon coined scientific imperialism by Dr. Ellis T. Powell during an address in 1920. He used the term to describe the subjection of all the developed and undeveloped powers of the earth to the mind of man. The term is still used by critics today when referring to situations in which they perceive science to act imperiously. Would I describe the exploration of outer space as scientific imperialism? Yes, probably. As every new discovery is named, it, the object or place, is consumed and owned by our language, captured and contained by our knowledge of its existence and its occupation of space. It is therefore considered undesirable to be an object or a noun to be objectified. It is much more desirable to be a subject, or so it was believed. So according to Hito Sterl in her text, A Thing Like You and Me from 2010, she says, to become a subject carried with it, carried with it the promise of autonomy, sovereignty, agency. To be a subject was good, to be an object was bad. But as we all know, being a subject can be tricky. The subject is always already subjected. Though the position of the subject suggests a degree of control, its reality is rather one of being subjected to power relations. Sterile contradicts popular belief and suggests siding with the objects for a change. To be a thing among things. Consequently, it could be argued that my effort to save the Earth's moon from a capitalist market by, eradica by eradicating its title moon is redundant. A raised moon is a growing list of phrases describing the moon or using only adjectives and verbs, borrowing from the language of Tlan, displayed a scrolling font across a screen, the epitome of 21st century consumerism. In 1940, Borges described the fictitious world of Tlan in one of his infamous short stories. Set seven years in the future, he alludes to an unmaterialistic world, one in which the inhabitants speak a language void of nouns. This change in speech shifts the inhabitants' understanding of their world as objects in space to a world understood as a series of actions. In this world, the subject is definitely more important than the object. However, in 2020, it is unclear if the moon is free from exploitation by redefining it as a subject. The contemporary capitalists no longer need objects or nouns to make money. They are already capitalizing on people's actions while also accumulating data to predetermine and control their behavior, a double whammy. Most people can gaze at the moon in the sky, <clears throat> but what are the consequences of gazing at the moon on Google Moon and who is profiting? A question that highlights the possessive nature of mapping and the power gained by the cartographer. Possession. In 1972, the astronauts from the Apollo 17 mission brought back samples of moon rock to be analysed. These stolen rocks became objects when President Nixon ordered them to be divvied up and gifted to all states and countries. They objectify the moon because they make its surface ownable. They also prove that humans went there and we do love objects of evidence. We have museums full of them. 
they mediate the past to the present. Artifacts and tangible organic objects have value and are connected with our search for truth. Knowledge and information also have a price and are associated with power. It is therefore perhaps a little concerning that the moon is only known through the first-hand experience of 12 white American men. Do you need first-hand experience to truly know something? Do you need contact with the object? Will it help me to know the moon if I can see with my own eyes the 1.14 grams of moon rock that was gifted to me as an Irish citizen by President Nixon in 1973? By accepting this gift, did we, the Irish people, elect Nixon as the owner of the moon? Can you gift something that does not belong to you? Does it now go without saying that Nixon once owned the moon and if so, was it bequeathed to NASA or Google? If this was or is the case, then I do not accept this stolen gift. I will travel back in time to steal the stolen moon rock. I will pluck it from the hands of the four white men in suits adorning it, freeing it from the grasp of a capitalist patriarchy and return it to lunar soil. Um, <clears throat> so here, yes, yeah, so in that text, I suppose I am explaining the two video pieces. Um, so a raised moon, um, exists or began as a series of moon descriptions um, borrowing or appropriating the language of Tlan, uh, which was created by the Argentinian writer, Argentinian writer Borges. Um, so by <laughs> my hope was or yeah what I was trying to do was by erasing the word moon or the noun moon that the moon would no longer exist as an object and that it could therefore could not be possessed um, or owned or colonized. Um, yeah, so I know that the Outer Space, Space Treaty exists and says that um, no celestial body can be colonized, but it is obviously then, yeah, problematic that there is a flag that was inserted into the surface of the moon and the fact that private companies have been granted permission to land on the moon um, in an effort to mine its soil and that they can capitalize on the moon. So anyway, so yeah, I'm trying to save the moon or free it from a capitalist society by using language. Um, so these are my moon descriptions using only adjectives, adverbs and verbs. Uh, so at the moment the list exists as 25 descriptors. So I hope that the list will continue to grow. Um, I initially just started writing out these descriptions, um, unsure of exactly how, um, how they'd be presented to an audience. Um, you know, I was thinking at one stage that they would exist just as a typed list. Um, I also considered maybe creating or putting them into a publication. Um, so I was looking at this beautiful text by the Scottish artist Katie Patterson. Um, so it is a book called A Place That Exists Only in Moonlight. Um, a book which contains a series of artworks to exist only in the imagination comprising over 100 short texts. Each concerns the landscape, the universe, or an expanded sense of earthly and geological time. These poetic phrases take shape in the mind of whoever reads the words, and so become an expression of the idea itself. Uh, so within my practice, I am interested in this relationship between language um, and text and its relationship to the visual. Um, so I just go back a slide um, because, yeah, there's probably just a little bit of a better description here of Borges's text, his short story. Um, so in his short story, um, he describes an encyclopedia from a fictitious planet and on that planet they speak a different language. Um, and I think it's kind of so clever, this change in perception, um, you know, that if there is, 
if there are no nouns or objects, it becomes an unmaterialistic world and that you see the world as a series of actions. So it's again just highlighting the importance of language um, and the possessive nature of language. And I suppose that was kind of what I was interested in. Um, so eventually I decided to experiment or play around with these descriptors existing as a moving image. And I wanted them or imagined them scrolling across a screen, just a normal flat LED screen. Um, but again, through kind of experimentation, um, the work became something else. Um, so I was um, in my house, I transformed my house into a gallery. Um, so in the absence of a graduate exhibition, I decided to convert my sitting room into a gallery for private viewings. Um, of, of course, in keeping with the guidelines outlined by the HSE. So I completely blacked out the space and um, created this or molded this mountainous form using black fabric and projected the scrolling font across this form. And I just really liked the way the words moved in and out of the crevices. Um, so yeah, again, it's just really sometimes through experimentation that a work that a work can develop. You know, the concept is there, but it's also important. Um, its display is also just as important. Um, so here's just a little video of how the work was projected um, across this form of fabric. Uh, so it was quite important to me that the form was mountainous um, because I have been greatly inspired by these early photographs by James Nasmith from 1874. So while these look like photographs of the moon, they are in fact photographs of miniature plaster models. Um, so Nasmith was looking, he was looking at the moon through a telescope, but rather than photographing the moon directly, he was making very detailed illustrations and then creating these miniature models and photographing the models. Um, so yeah, I just, um, I like this um, relationship between yeah, just the fact that often people perceive a photograph to be um, a truthful or honest document. Um, so within my own practice, I play with this as a lens-based artist um, and as a video artist, often making things and then um, by photographing them or videoing them, you can play with people's perception of the scale, um, etc. So, I particularly like I particularly like this photograph on the left hand side um so you can see that um it, it, the moon it was believed that the moon was mountainous um rather than it being um you know with kind of with mountain sharp pointy mountains um because the the shadows of the moon are so on the moon are so exaggerated that it was believed that when it was believe that when they landed on the moon that this is what they would find. Um, so again it just highlights how knowledge and information is constantly changing and evolving. Um, so this is just a still from my video The Clinching Gift. Um, so I'm going to show you a little snippet, a trailer, just kind of a, a short clip um, from this video.
Um, so the clinching gift is a moving image created using archival footage and material. Um, combined with my own sets, hand narration and sound effects. Um, it's an investigation into the gifting of moon rock from President Nixon to President Childers. Um, so a lot of my research I conducted within the National Archives of Ireland, where I had direct access to letters um, back and forth uh, between President Nixon and a variety of different Irish presidents trying to organize these gifting ceremonies. Um, so this video piece that I've made, The Clinching Gift, um, particularly focuses on the gifting of moon rock in 1973, which was rock that had been brought back uh, from the Apollo 17 mission. Um, so it was part of the goodwill gifts um, by President Nixon. So yeah, so I was particularly, I just loved this um, news clipping, this photograph in particular. So you can see here President Childers um, being gifted a small little sliver, 1.14 grams, encased in an acrylic ball mounted on a plaque um, by the astronauts. So I think it's just, um, I think this image just says so much. Um, you can see there, it, the, it's, the, it's the men in suits and the hands um, kind of holding this plaque um, that I became a little bit fixated on and used or was kind of the, the initiator, of, initiator of, my, of my moving image. Um, I also really enjoyed going to the National Archives and having first-hand um, access to the correspondence between the various presidents. Um, some of what I found was very humorous. Um, so this is just one little kind of note um, that I wanted to share with you. Um, so this was, um, you can see there, Colonel Irwin to present president with an Irish flag which accompanied Colonel Irwin on the Apollo 15 lunar mission. Um, so this is just a letter or a note from the president's secretary and she's kind of, you know, trying to find out or ask him when is he available to accept this flag. So in this instance from Apollo 15 it was just a flag, um, there wasn't any lunar, lunar rock. So you can see there, um, Run on Tishig, have no objection if it suits you. Days mentioned are April the 7th or 8th, Holy Thursday or Good Friday. Even if you haven't left for Clare on Thursday, you may not be in good shape after dental hospital appointment on previous Tuesday. What do you think? And the president replies, which was President Hillary, I would plan to leave Oris 3.30 Thursday, if before that, okay. Um, so I think I just like all these little human elements, you know, that it was such a big feat um, to go to the moon. Yet, what does it mean for the ordinary or everyday person? Um, so you can see here, you know, even the president, he, he's got other things going on. You know, these guys went to the moon, but he's got to go to Claire. Um, so I kind of wanted to bring these, yeah, these just little humorous or humorous elements into my video work. Um, this is again from the National Archives, it is a hand-drawn map. So this would have been the map used to direct or guide the astronauts around Dublin City. Um, so again, I just think it's funny that these guys managed to navigate their way to the moon yet this very simplistic map is what was being utilised to help them to navigate Dublin City. Um, so within my video piece, um, you do, yeah, I'm kind of always combining maybe the real with the fictitious um, and using real archival documents and then combining that with my own kind of fictitious sets or replicas. So the notion of the replica is also quite important to me in my practice. 
Um, so, yeah, so here on the left hand side is an original document from the archives. Um, so you can see there in the bottom paragraph, it says, um, the United States government has expressed the hope that the government of Ireland will designate an appropriate institution where the plaque could be placed on permanent display for the public. So this was in relation to the plaque that we were presented in 1973. Um, so as part of my research, I tried to view this plaque. So um, I went to the National Museum of Ireland, where it was presumably housed. And when I got there, they told me it had been taken off permanent display because they were concerned that it would be stolen. Because a lot of moon rocks in other institutions have been stolen. Um, so in order to see it, I would have to try to get a private viewing. Um, which I tried to do, um, but it would just ended up being quite difficult. Um, if I really wanted to see it, I presume I could have, but it was a, a lot of emails back and forth and trying to find a suitable time. Um, so it kind of made me start thinking, you know, was it necessary for me to see this original piece of moon rock? And would it give me any greater insight into, into anything? You know, would it help me to feel closer to the moon? Um, so yeah, I was kind of, yeah, that kind of became part of the video in itself. Um, the fact that maybe I didn't need to see the original, maybe the original doesn't matter. Um, so interestingly, um, this plaque here on the right hand side is actually a replica. So I did see this in person, um, and used photographs of this replica in my video. Um, so um, on two different occasions, Ireland were gifted moon rock um, from the Apollo 11 mission and the Apollo 17 mission. So the first pieces of moon rock from the Apollo 11 mission were subsequently lost in a fire at Dunsink Observatory. Um, so Ireland, have currently purchased um, a replica of that and then decided, oh, we may as well get a replica of the Apollo 17 moon rock, um, which will go on public display soon. Um, so yeah, this is, I just wanted to maybe show a little bit of um, inside um, our background kind of images of how I created uh, the clinching gift. So a lot of the scenes where I am cutting up the moon rock, they are fictitious. Um, they are created in the studio by me using a miniature set. However, I'm combining them with real video footage from NASA. So during my two years of the MFA, I signed up to be a digital archivist. Um, where I had, again, direct um, access to video footage from NASA. Um, so this shows some kind of scientists um, analysing these moon rocks. Um, I also maybe thought, I don't know, there was some kind of weird connection in the light of COVID-19. Um, this may be fear of disease and contamination. Um, and the fact that these rocks were brought back from the moon and they were so terrified of um, yeah, if they were exposed to air, what they might contain. So the, the lunar samples have never been exposed to, to air. Um, and also, you know, the fact that the astronauts had to quarantine upon their return. Um, but now, obviously, it's very important that we don't contaminate outer space. Um, so that's just maybe another, another kind of side note. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, and then combining, so you can see there that it's a real letter from the National Archives combined with a replica moon rock from the Natural History Museum. Um, so it's again, I'm kind of interested in this kind of display of artifacts or organic forms in museums and the role of the institution and how much we trust them. And again, that's tied up with um, um, knowledge and power um, within society. 
so I think that kind of concludes my talk. Um, I hope I explain things somewhat coherently. Um, this then is just a short list of key texts that have informed my work throughout my MFA. Um, so there might be something there that you would like to further read up on. Um, I would highly recommend reading Oliver Morton's book, The Moon, um, A History for the Future. Um, there's, yeah, just so much in that book um, and great references um, to lots of different sci-fi movies and also different texts. Um, yeah, I can't re recommend it anymore. Uh, so thank you very much for listening to my talk and I'm very much looking forward to listening to the talks by the upcoming artists. Um, okay, thank you. Hello. I am Celina Lage from Brazil. I hope you all are very well. I'm so happy and excited to be here with you today. Thank you so much for this kind invitation. Today, I will be sharing with you some thoughts about uh, ancient Greek poetry, philosophy and astronomy. I prepared um, I start showing you this amazing photography from the moon. As you can see from this uh, amazing point of view from the Sunium temple of Poseidon, it is near Athens in Attica. It's a fascinating scene and uh, I'm happy to start with this. The night sky is an overall mystery to contemplate. Humans are drawn to the when, where, how and why of it. Throughout human history, the fascination with the celestial world has given rise to many myths and tales, inspiring artists and thinkers like you <laughs> that are seeing me now. First of all, I have to refer Homer in his texts, we can learn about the ancient conception of the world. We can observe that Greek appellation for many of the stars and constellations have remained the same until today, as pointed, pointed out by many scholars. Wait, I'm returning here a little bit. <laughs> the Iliad and the Odyssey, dated to the 18th century before Christ, are both a rich source of astronomical knowledge of the ancient Greek civilization. Here are the shield of Achilles. It is described in a passage in the book 18th, 18th, sorry, lines 478, 608 of Homer's Iliad. Homer meticulously guides us through a description of the shield's progressive fabrication. In this image, you can see a diagram of the shield from the iris center. Of course, uh, the shield is only a literary description 
we do not have the piece, the shield itself as an artwork to see how it was. We didn't find any archaeological object uh, similar to this. And uh, the description is very complex. Many scholars try to figure out and to, to draw uh, kind of diagrams, artistic representations of the suit, but it is very, very difficult. Here in this uh, diagram from the Irish Centre, we can see the river ocean around all over the suit. And inside the suit, we have a centric um, circles, concentric circles, representing many activities, human activities. And at the very center of this diagram, we have the sky, the sea, stars, sun, and moon. The shield of Achilles is forged by Hephaestus, the god of fire, metalworking, forges, and the art of sculpture. Hephaestus adds figurative decorations. He models the world, the sky and the seas, the sun, the moon, and all the stars and constellations according to Homer. And uh, I quote here Homer. He made the earth upon it, and the sky, and the sea's water, and the tireless sun, and the moon, waxing into her fullness, and on it all the constellations, and fasten the heavens. The Pleiades and the Hyades and the strength of Orion and the Bear. Von Man gives also the name of Bygon, who turns about in a fixed place and looks at Orion, and she alone is never plunged in the wash of the ocean. This is the translation, the translation of Latin more. The shield of Achilles is huge, heavy and round with several concentric cycles, each depicting different scenes. In the very center, there's a picture of the universe. Around these are depictions of major constellations such as Orion and the Bear. For many scholars, Achilles' suit is purely symbolic. Ferrucci says, sees Achilles' suit more broadly symbolic. I called a round in shape and cycle by a representation of the ocean river, which is also the outer boundary of the earth. And with the sun, the moon and all the constellations depicted in the center, it is a compendium of the cosmos. End of quotation. Detailed reconstruction of the suit is impossible, writes Webster. Nothing so comprehensive and detailed as this could ever have been seen by Homer or his audience, says Hugan. It is not to be supposed that the poet had ever seen such a shield as he describes, claims Gardner. Despite of this thesis, many artists 
try to figure out and to represent visually the shield. Arietes states out that perhaps, however, the best use for this representation of the shield is to stimulate the imagination. Regarding the text while gazing on the illustrations, it is possible, at least like, to be swallowed up into the ancient scenes and to imagine oneself dancing and falling in love, or, in my case, as one of the elders educating a controversy. We can see here another attempt to represent visually the suit. And this is a work by Kathleen Veil. You see again the ocean around all the this, this suit, many activities, human activities, agriculture, wars. Um, many rituals being celebrated at and at the very center the the universe moon stars and earth and also the sun Some scholars argued that the astronomical content of Homer's description of the shield of Achilles at Iliad is essentially seasonal and consequently agriculture in its import. They discuss a sense in which the bear is linked to the Pleiades and the riots and the realm and which therefore makes its mention season specific. There are many possible interpretations and the studies of it, nothing is conclusive. So now I drive you through some of the pills. My beloved <laughs> text uh, commenting on very special fragments of Greek archaic poetry and pre-Socratic philosophy. And they are fragments, as you can see in this photo, this picture. Deeply influencing the Western literary tradition, these fragments represent an inaugural moment of the Greek poetry responsible for various aspects of our sensitivity and worldview. Lyric poetry had an eminently popular aspect and was intended for diversified segments of democratic society, focusing on the common man, his experience and impressions of the world. This new form was more concerned and attuned to the present, the here and now. Now, sorry, they were a kind of pop songs at that time, written to be singed and sometimes danced, and to be performed with the accompaniment of musical instruments. During the archaic age lyricism as a form severed as a vehicle for the most diverse manifestations ranging from from pre-socratic philosophy to the most varied religious manifestations in addition to legislation oracles epitaphs etc I start with Archilochus of Paros. Um, he lived at circa 680 
645 before Christ. Here you see one a representation of a poet uh, play an instrument and singing to the people declaiming his poems. Archilochus of Paros was an ancient Greek lyrical poet from the island of Paros. One of the earliest Greek poets after Homer and Hesiod. He is the earliest no Greek writer to compose his works almost entirely on the theme of his own emotions and experience. The song of a nobleman and slave woman, Achilochus was also a mercenary soldier and took part in the colonization of the island of Tassos. Archilochus on the solar eclipse and 648 BC. Archilochus makes clear reference to a very large solar eclipse in one of his poems. He gives an why witness account to a solar eclipse that occurred in over the Aegean Sea during the later years of his life. And here we have the fragment 122, and I will read it for you. Nothing can be surprising anymore or impossible or miraculous. Now that Zeus, father of the Olympians, has made night, night out of noonday, hiding the bright sunlight, and fear has come upon mankind. After this, men can believe anything, expect anything. Don't any of you be surprised in future if land beasts change places with dolphins and go to live in their salty pastures and get to like the sounding waves of the sea more than the land while the dolphins prefer the mountains. The description of the loss of daylight, night out of noonday, strongly suggests that the eclipse was either total or feel slightly short of this phase. Evidently, the phenomenon left a singularly profound impression on its beholders. As According to Stephenson, based on the above considerations, I shall assume that the eclipse was either total or nearly so it the Paros or Thassos, reference to the global eclipse maps of von Oppolzer, indicates that between 700 and 610 before Christ, only the following solar obscurations could have been total in this region. And he um, indicates uh, many uh, possible dates for these eclipses. Several annular eclipses would also have been visible in the Aegean during the same period, but in each case, the magnitude with the central zone was between about 0.93 and 0.96. None of these events could have caused the impressive loss 
of daylight described so vividly by Archilochus. Um, now I'll bring to you Sappho of Lesbos. Um, the date is circa 630 and 570 before Christ. Sappho was an archaic poet, Greek poet, from the island of Lesbos. She is known for her lyric poetry written to be sung while accompanied by a lyre. In ancient times, she was widely regarded as one of the greatest lyric poets and was given names such as the Tenth Muse. Her work was organized into nine books of lyric poetry in the famous library of Alexandria in Egypt. The two major sources of surviving fragments of Sappho are quotations in other ancient works from a bold poem to as a little as a single word and fragments of papyrus many of which were discovered at Oxyrhynchos city in Egypt. Uh, here you can see uh, the one pic of this uh, text, the papyrus uh, found in Oxyrhynchos. As you can see, it's very, very fragmented. Um, this the moonlight poem as we know it is very very short very beautiful and uh, i read it now for you the moon is down the pleiades midnight the hours flow on. I lie alone. Salfo talks about the Pleiades. The Pleiades, a cluster of extremely bright stars near Taurus, as you can see in this uh, peak in this uh, representation. The question is, at what time of year would the moon and Pleiades have set before midnight? Sappho mentions two interesting facts. She watches the Pleiades go down, sinking beneath the horizon. And this occurs before midnight. Two science, scientists got interested in this poem because they realized these two facts could be used to determine precisely what time of year Sappho wrote the poem. A team of physicists and astronomers who discovered the time of year that Sappho witnessed the constellation Pleiades referenced her in her midnight poem with a software uh, package called Starry Night. Probably you have this in your mobile phone. <laughs> Their findings originally was published in the Journal of Astronomical History and Heritage. Since 
the poem says that Sappho saw the Pleiades go down before midnight, first they deduced where Sappho was located geographically when she wrote the poem. Then they checked the star charts from, from that vantage point and figured out what time of the year the Pleiades would have been visible right until midnight. Using this method, the scientists discovered that Sappho could have been could have seen the Pleiades before midnight from the late winter until the early spring. And I called them. Assuming that Sappho observed from Mytilene on the island of Lesbos, we determined that in 470 BC, the Pleiades set before midnight from 25 of January on and were lost to the evening twilight completely by 6th of April. As science historian Darren Highton pointed out, the researchers' findings are based on a set of untested assumptions. I quote here, there is of course the possibility that Midnight Poem is an invected reflection for all we know, Sappho could simply imagine the Pleiades. And even if the poem does reflect a reality Sappho experienced, the researchers can know for certain that she wrote it on the very night of her lonely stargazing. So it's a polemic <laughs> theme, very polemic. Uh, all, all, all these um, theories about antiquity, about uh, the context, and uh, uh, every time we compare the text with the reality, it uh, causes a very big polemic. As uh, we can uh, read in many texts and books. So now I um, I uh, finish with Sappho uh, with this quote. Sappho should be consi considered an informal contributor to the early Greek astronomy as well as to the Greek society at large. Kuntz added. Not many ancient poets comment on astronomical observations as clearly as she does. This is a fact, it's a beautiful poem and I love it. Uh, now I'll bring to you some reflections about um, Thales. Thales of Miletus, I live at circa um, 624, 546 before Christ. He was an early pre-Socratic philosopher, mathematician and astronomer from the Greek city of Miletus in Ionia, modern day Turkey. He was one of the so-called seven sages of Greece, and many regard him as the first philosopher in the Western tradition. The pre-Socratic uh, philosophers are the Western thinkers preceding Socrates. The early pre-Socratic philosophers, of which Thales was one of the very first, 
try to define the substance or substances of which all material objects were composed. He searched for the thesis or nature in Greek of objects that cause them to behave in their characteristic way. He was one of the first Western philosophers who attempted to find naturalistic explanations of the world without reference to supernatural or mythological explanations. His most famous belief was his cosmological doctrine that water was the first principle. He claimed that water was the origin of all things, that from which all things emerge and to which they return, and moreover, that all things ultimately are water. Presocratic philosophers from Aeonia pioneered the unifying approach for the physical world, assuming one element as the basis for everything in the universe, cosmos. This was water to Thales, air for Anaximenes, infinity for Anaximander, fire for Heraclitus. Greek philosophers seem to be unique in offering speculative theories of heavenly phenomena. You often base it on physical models of the world and his contents. Sorry, the, the um, letters are very small in this uh, slide. There's some problem here with my file. Um, now it's okay. <laughs> Thales had an effective theory of the path of the sun from solstice to solstice and supposedly correctly predicted a solar eclipse. Some sources have attributed him with the discovery of the seasons of the year and the 365 day year, consistent of course with his determination of the solstice. He questioning approach to the understanding of heavenly phenomena arguably marked the real beginning of Greek astronomy. In the case of Thales, we actually have no reliable astronomical theory to go on. That's really. It seems likely that he left no written record of his theories. Aristotle himself seems to have had no written record of Thales. On the solar eclipse, Thales first said that sun, the sun is eclipsed when the moon moves directly under it and the moon is seen to be earthy. On the lunar eclipse, Thales, Anaxagoras, Plato and the Stoics, in agreement with the mathematical astronomers say, the moon's conjunction with the sun and the fact that it is illuminated by the sun cause the monthly disappearance of the moon and it's moving in the, into the shadow of the earth cause its eclipses. That was the 
their explanation as the earth lies between both bodies. Graham states out that the pre-Socratic philosophers made major contributions to astronomy that are so fundamental that we tend to take them for granted and overlook them in a search for a different kind of contribution which they did not make. For the side, um, I like very much um, this text by Plato. Plato presents the portrait of the philosopher in the Theaetetus, the dialogue. Plato relates the humorous story that Thales fell into a wheel while stargazing. <laughs> The Thetetus is meant to show the limits of what we nowadays call science or scientific knowledge. In this dialogue, Socrates doesn't consider a stargazing Thales to be a model to be imitated. I hold this to be a caricature of a philosopher. And here I quote uh, Plato and the Socrates uh, are speaking. Take the case of Thales. While he was studying the stars and looking upwards, he fell, he fell into a pit and a neat, witty Thracian servant girl jeered at him, they say, because he was so eager to know the things in the sky that could not see what was there before him at his very feet. The same jest applies to all who pass their lives in philosophy. The story of Thales failing into a will while gazing at the stars also was originally recorded in this text uh, in Plato's Tetetus. Other ancient tellings sometimes vary the person, person of the rescuer, but regularly retain the rescuer's coffin, remark that it would be better to keep one's mind on the earth. It's a common uh, place. The fragments uh, that I presented here show only some uh, remains of the rich ancient production. It is like a painting disfigured by time, whose outlines are still marked by the strength of the brush. But the colors and details of the figure have, been, have been completely erased. What we had left were just fragments of fragments copied Remember it from memory, corrected, erased, confused, so and quoted by the very strength of the words, images, sounds and rhythms. Finally, the sky observation is a point of convergence among poetry, philosophy, and early astronomy. This talk was uh, an invitation to you to know this magnificent literary piece addressed to lovers of poetry, astronomy, philosophy, and the arts, 
will probably admire the beauty, strength and sensitivity of this verse, just as I do. So I finish here and uh, I say goodbye to you. Stay well, stay safe. Bye bye.